Greetings, this is Greg. In this video, I'll be discussing the Folke Wolf TA-152H1. This plane was capable of incredible speed at very high altitude and used some interesting technology to do it. Before I go any farther, I want to say there are very few pictures of these planes from the war. There were not a lot of these built, and by the later stages of the war, it was difficult to get food or medicine in Germany. You can imagine the issues with trying to get film. After the war, the Allies were primarily focused on German jet and rocket technology, and thus, very few pictures were taken of captured TA-152s. Therefore, I'm apologizing in advance for the low number of pictures in this presentation and the fact that not all of the pictures will be of the variant being discussed. Let's get started by looking at just how fast the TA-152 is. I'm going to focus on the TA-152H1 model, which was the high altitude variant and probably the only variant to actually reach production. Unless I specifically say otherwise, I'm referring to this model, the H1. Data on TA-152 production is a bit sketchy. On that subject, original source material for the plane is a bit scarce. Thankfully, there's enough to compare speeds and cover a lot of the design factors, but as you'll see, in some cases, I'll have to use my opinions to uh, fill in the gaps. So, let's start with something that is an official source document. The lines on this graph are giving us speed throughout the altitude range. I put blue arrows here to point out the earlier FW190A8 and A9 speeds. We're not covering these in this video, but take note that they both have a significant decrease in performance starting at about 6,200 meters or about 20,000 feet and by 10,000 meters which is about 32,800 feet they're out of steam. I'm going to try and make an effort to use both meters and feet in this episode. A lot of my subscribers and Patreons love the metric system and, and I get it. It's an easy system to use. Anyway, the 190A series performance loss at high altitude was a problem because US bombers were coming in at 25,000 feet. Their escorts were often at 30,000. The Germans had the reasonable expectation that the next generation of US bombers, meaning of course B-29s, would be coming in much higher and faster. Of course B-29s never bombed Germany, but it wasn't an unreasonable concern, thus the need for a high altitude fighter was apparent. Volker Wolf's answer was the TA-152H1. Its performance is shown here on the chart with the red arrow. The other line there is for the 152C model, which C is in Charlie, which was the low and medium altitude variant. So let's follow the 152H line up from the bottom and see what's going on here. Then we'll take a closer look at the tech involved. Starting at the bottom, and I'll circle the points in blue to make this easier to follow. We have the plane's maximum speed at sea level, which is 577 kph or 358 miles per hour. That's not bad, but it's not stellar for a late war fighter. As the plane climbs, the speed goes up because, as you know, the air gets thinner and the air resistance decreases for a given true airspeed. At 2,000 meters, about 6,500 feet, the plane is doing 622 kph or 386 miles per hour. At this point, the supercharger's first speed can no longer maintain manifold pressure. Power starts to drop off, hence the speed stops increasing until we reach 2700 meters, about 8900 feet, at which point the second speed is engaged. Note that the aircraft flight manual says to engage this speed at 2500 meters plus or minus 200. So, we're simply going by the chart here, but be aware there is some pilot discretion on when to engage these things. Using the second speed, we're starting to get somewhere. At 7,000 meters, we're doing 698 kph, or 433 miles per hour. That's not enough to make the TA-152 the fastest plane in the sky, but at this altitude, it's at least very competitive. Now at 7,000 meters plus or minus 500 feet, we can engage the third supercharger speed. This is at uh, about 23,000 feet. A third speed was very rare in World War II fighters, but the TA-152 has one. This third speed enables us to reach 
733 kph or 454 miles per hour at 9,500 meters. At this altitude, the only fighter capable of outrunning the TA-152 was the P-47M, M as in Mike, and it couldn't do it for very long due to its water methanol supply and limitation. I'm excluding jets here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those later. At 454 miles per hour, the TA-152 was faster at this altitude than any P-51 Spitfire or Tempest that saw combat during the war. As we climb higher in our TA-152, speed will start to drop off as even our third speed has to run out of breath eventually. However, at 11,500 meters or 37,700 feet, that's really high, we can trigger the first stage of our GM-1 system, which we'll be going over in more detail later. This gives us a boost in speed of 35 kph. That gives us 735 kph or 456 miles per hour at this altitude. At 12,500 meters, 41,000 feet, we can engage the second stage of GM-1 and reach 752 kph or 466 miles per hour. Note, I often read the maximum speed of this plane at 41,000 feet as 759 kph, which is 472 miles per hour. I can't find an original source with that number. It's probably out there. In any case, I do think it's realistic. I am sure that due to quality control issues, each plane varied a bit in testing, and a lot could be changed with the MW50 or GM1 systems to gain a little bit more speed. In any case, the chart we're using for this video is the one you see here. But if you really want to consider the plane 7 kph faster, that's fine. I'll compare these speeds with Allied fighters a little later in this video, and you'll see that 7 kph just won't matter. Let's take a look at the TA-152H1's engine. Now, if this is the first video you've seen on this channel, you might want to watch some other ones before this. I'll put some suggestions in the description. I'm assuming at this point that the viewer understands supercharger stages, supercharger speeds, water methanol injection, and has some idea what induced drag is. If not, that's okay, but this video isn't the best place to start as I'm not going to cover those things in detail. For the 152H1, uh, the engine is the Junkers Yumo 213E. E is an echo. It has 35 liters of displacement, which by late war standards was not unusually large. Would have been large in 1941 for a liquid-cooled V12, but not by this point. For example, the Daimler-Benz DB605, which was used in most of the later 109s, had 35.7 liters. The Rolls-Royce Griffin had 36.7. And the big boy of the bunch, the Daimler-Benz DB603, had a massive 44.52 liters. So that 35 liters wasn't that much in comparative terms. The TA-152's designer, Kurt Tank, really wanted the big DB603 engine, and it was used in some prototypes, so we'll get to it. But the UMO 213E was the engine used in the 152H models. The 213 only has three valves per cylinder, two intake, and one exhaust. This was a comparative drawback as the DB engines as well as Merlin's, Allison's, many others had four valves per cylinder, but the TA-152 had to make do with three. There was an effort to upgrade the UMO 213 to a four valve design, but it wasn't finished before the war ended. Now it may appear, based on the number of exhaust ports when you look at pictures of the motor, that the UMO 213 does have two exhaust valves per cylinder. However, this is because the on this engine the exhaust valve stem is blocking the port exit. Not ideal for flow and the Junkers designers simply split the port in two to go around the valve stem. You can clearly see that in uh, some cutaway pictures. The 213 did have some pluses. It was able to rev a bit higher than other engines as high as 3300 RPM, most aircraft V12s of the day had RPM limits between 2800 and 3000, so that's a plus. And although this next point is very hard to quantify or even really back up, I do have the impression that the UMO was a tougher engine than the DB605 used in late model 109s. 
In short, the UMO 213 was a fine engine, but not stellar. Its main advantage over the Daimler-Benz engine was that it was available, and sometimes that's what really matters. To make up for this, they combined it with several power-adding features. First, we have the supercharger itself. It's a two-stage unit, which means that it has one larger supercharger impeller feeding a smaller impeller, which feeds the engine. It's essentially a supercharged supercharger on a supercharged engine. Two-stage systems were very effective, and this is an area where the Germans had been behind. The U.S. had two-stage systems years earlier, and the British had it on the Spitfire Mark 9 and subsequent models. The two stages really helped breathe life into the UMO 213. I do think the supercharger impellers were a highly efficient design. I'm basing that opinion on the fact that the NACA report on the older supercharger impeller in the earlier UMO 211, they found that this older design engine had an impeller with inefficiencies equal, or efficiencies maybe, equal to that of the latest US designs. So I think it's safe to assume that the 213s were at least that good. Next, we have an aftercooler, commonly called an intercooler. This does two things. First, it cools the air charge, increasing the density, giving more power. Second, it reduced the tendency to knock, thus allowing more manifold pressure uh, with a given level of fuel quality, meaning octane. Again, this was an area where the Germans had been behind the curve. The U.S. Wildcat and all subsequent U.S. Navy fighters had intercoolers. So did the P-38 and P-47 and Merlin Power P-51. So this wasn't new, but charge coolers were not common in German fighters. So the TA-152's dual stages and aftercooler really brought it up to current standards, not really ahead of them. For example, the P-51's Merlin is configured the same way dual stages and an aftercooler. Next, they added a three-speed supercharger drive, and this did put it ahead of the Allied systems, at least most of them. Typical V12-powered fighters in the European theater had one or two speeds. You may remember from the chart earlier that third speed really helps keep power and thus performance up at higher altitudes. So, we have a great supercharger system, but performance will of course be limited by the relatively low octane German fuel. I don't want to turn this into a fuel seminar, but at this point in the war, the Germans had two main types of fuel for use in piston engine fighters. They were B4 and C3, the C3 being the higher of the two. I've talked about this uh, more extensively in videos before. Now. To put it mildly, there were some issues with supply, and being able to use B4 was probably an advantage. The TA-152H1 actually uses the lower octane B4 fuel. However, with the MW50 methanol water injection system, there is so much anti-knock protection that it was able to run enough manifold pressure to generate 2,050 horsepower, and that's an impressive number for a V12 running on 87 octane fuel. I couldn't find too many specifics on the MW50 system as it was set up in this plane, but it's very clear that unlike other German planes, the TA-152's MW50 system was designed in from the start. It wasn't an afterthought. The tank is located in the wing, just inboard of the fuel tank. Some sources say that it's in the left wing only. I couldn't verify that either way. In any case, it had a lot of capacity and could run at full power with the MW50 spraying for 30 minutes continuously. I should mention, and I'm just thinking of this now, um, the DB603, and this is a little bit of an unfair comparison, okay, because the DB603, as used in the TA152, was never really fully developed, but apparently it could only spray MW50 for 10 minutes at a time, still 30 minutes, but 10 minutes, and then you'd have to wait for the temperatures to come back down, and then 10 minutes again. and by all the documentation I've found, that limitation doesn't exist for the UMO, so that could be an advantage uh, for the UMO, but again, you know, we're comparing a version that reached production to a version that didn't. So in any case, 30 minutes, that's a long time. For comparison, the P-51D and P-47D 
Both had five minute limitations for war emergency power. I'll get into that a bit more later. All this is great so far. A dual stage, triple speed supercharger, the ability to run at high power using MW50 for 30 minutes. However, as the aircraft climbs, eventually even this supercharger system is going to run out of breath. And at that point, the MW50 won't help much because the high levels of manifold pressure needed to really take advantage of it just won't be available. The solution was the GM1, which stands for Gehring Mixture 1. I'm not really sure what Hermann Gehring's involvement was in this. Uh, I guess I'm not 100% sure it's named after Hermann Gehring. But in any case, that's what it stands for. Uh, this is what we would now call a nitrous oxide system. Here's the idea. If we could simply spray 100% oxygen into the engine, we could then add the proper amount of fuel and add power. And in fact, this has been done but outside of a laboratory, it's totally impractical, which is why it hasn't been done in a production airplane. There are two main problems. Uh, there are, well, there are more than two, but I'm covering these two. The first one is storage. This is easy to understand. An oxygen tank doesn't hold all that much. Think of how big the tanks are that supply one individual breathing, either a scuba tank, a bottle of me medical oxygen, aviation oxygen, whatever. A 2,000 horsepower engine would delete, correction, would deplete such a tank in seconds. The required storage tank size for an engine boosted with pure oxygen would be too large. The second problem, and this one isn't a big deal, but the pressure in the tank will decrease as the oxygen is used. Thus, a regulator is needed to ensure the quantity of flow remains constant. This is easy when it's a person breathing, but it's more difficult when it's a 2,000 horsepower engine because the rate of the pressure drop in the bottle is going to be tremendous. Injecting nitrous oxide solves these and other problems. First of all, when you compress this gas, it turns into a liquid. That liquid is dense. Thus, you can get a lot of nitrous oxide into a relatively small bottle. It's going to turn back into a gas when released into the supercharger intake, which in this application is where they spray it. But the ability to store it as a liquid is a huge plus. Yes, I know there's such a thing as liquid oxygen. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody's going to bring that up. But that's cryogenic rocket ship stuff, and it doesn't really apply here because it's never been used in a production airplane, let alone a World War II fighter. Another, well, a production piston engine airplane, I should say. Another bonus of nitrous oxide is it doesn't need a regulator as it leaves the storage tank, vapor forms above the liquid and keeps the pressure in the tank essentially constant. So tank pressure will be the same with a full bottle or when it's down by 80% or whatever. Thus, using nitrous oxide allows us to add in oxygen, since that's what nitrous oxide is by definition, nitrogen and oxygen, but without the drawbacks of using pure oxygen. Now, these systems are very simple. There's an 85 liter storage tank behind the cockpit. When activated, nitrous from that system sprays into the supercharger inlet. At that point, the pressure drop turns it back into a gas. It goes through the supercharger, it goes through the intercooler and into the engine. And yes, you can spray nitrous oxide through an intercooler because it's in a gaseous form. I actually talked to an expert on nitrous oxide from a vendor that makes those systems and he said absolutely no problem, just don't spray fuel through it, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, extra fuel is added to support the nitrous oxide in a meter, metered amount later on downstream. In the case of the TA-152H1, there are at least two stages of nitrous oxide. It's conceivable that maybe there were three stages. I, I, specifically, Wikipedia references three stages of nitrous, but I don't know what plane they're saying that that was used on. Uh, in any case, I have to say the specifics on this plane are in short supply. There are no TA-152s I can go look at. There's only one in the world. The Smithsonian has it. It's not on display. The pilot manual for the plane is terrible. Furthermore, it's for the earlier H-0 version. Uh, and the test data for the plane is minimal. Thus, I have to fill in some blanks here. The TA-152 has at least two stages of GM-1. I believe each stage adds 120 horsepower, so really not all that much. We can see those clearly on the performance charts, the stages that is. However, it may have had three stages. Typically, 
Um, they'd provide, like I say, 120 horsepower per stage, but you know they could change nozzle sizes and, and make them add more uh, up to whatever the engine could structurally handle. It's very difficult to say exactly what they had in operations, but two stages at 120 horsepower each is supported by what little documentation we have. It appears that these stages were manually triggered, meaning they could be triggered at lower altitudes, lower than shown on the chart. Perhaps that would have damaged the motor, shortened its life, maybe it would be fine, I just don't know. In any case, it's possible that these planes could have been set up for quite a bit more power than the published levels we normally see. That just about covers the engine stuff. In summary, we have a mediocre engine with 35 liters of displacement. However, it's force-fed with an advanced dual-stage three-speed supercharger blowing through an aftercooler, which is further supplemented by a good MW50 system and at least two stages of GM1, aka nitrous oxide. I should clarify what I meant by mediocre. The UMO 213 was a bit heavy and it didn't have four valves per cylinder and it had that issue with the valve stem block in the exhaust port. However, it appears that it was tough. Furthermore, as I said, it could run higher RPM than many other engines in its class and that helped it make power a bit. So it certainly wasn't bad, but I do think that the DB603, if prepared with the same features, would have been better especially since it has a uh, variable speed supercharger drive. Next, we have to discuss the wing. The 152H1 model has a high aspect ratio wing, pretty sure the highest aspect ratio wing of any World War II fighter. What is that and why does that matter? Well, aspect ratio is the length of the wing in relation to the average cord. The cord line being the line from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing. Since most wings on fighter planes are tapered, we take an average. Sometimes you see an airplane with a constant cord wing, and, and uh, that's usually done to lower production costs because every rib is basically the, the same thing. Uh, in any case, most fighters don't have particularly high aspect ratio wings. We normally see these on sailplanes or planes that need a lot of loiter time like maritime patrol aircraft. However, they offer advantages for flights at low indicated air speeds and that's very important for high altitude flight. That's why we see such a wing on the U-2 spy plane. At high altitudes, the indicated air speed is very low for a given true air speed. As many of our viewers know, induced drag is very high at low indicated airspeeds. A high aspect ratio requires a lower angle of attack at a given speed, thus has less induced drag than a similar design low aspect ratio wing. Thus, the high aspect ratio wing on the TA-152H1 is designed to minimize drag, thus maximize speed at very high altitudes at the expense of parasite drag at the high indicated air speeds it can reach at low altitudes. This is the primary reason the TA-152H1 is not particularly fast at low altitude by late war standards, but up high it's extremely fast. One drawback to a high aspect ratio wing is that it can be weak. Uh, that's just common sense looking at it. I don't think this was a problem for the TA-152 though because they used steel spars. All the sources I have found say that the steel spar was used due to shortages of aluminum. Maybe that's true, I guess maybe it probably is, but I haven't seen an original source document saying that. An alternative explanation is that to have enough strength to pull high G loads with this aspect ratio they needed steel spars. In any case, the maximum G limits and dive speeds of the TA-152 are comparable to other German fighters, so the wing strength apparently wasn't a problem. These features, meaning the engine's high altitude power and the wing design, give the 152 an incredibly high ceiling. Over 48,000 feet, some sources say 49,500 feet. No Allied fighter that saw combat during World War II could reach those altitudes, not even close. Of course, that in itself could be considered a drawback, that design feature that is. Why sacrifice performance at 25,000 feet where the fighting was actually taking place in exchange 
for an increase in performance at 40,000 feet and above. Well, as I alluded to earlier, I think that the reason they made that choice was because they didn't know what to expect from the B-29 and they assumed the worst. Had B-29s been coming over at 35,000 feet and say 350 miles an hour, the TA-152H1s could have loitered two miles above them, out of reach of the escorts, and when the time was right, dive down and take out a bomber in a single pass with the heavy cannon armament. It packed one 30 millimeter firing through the spinner and a pair of wing mounted 20 millimeters. After firing, it could then zoom back up out of reach of the escorts. Of course, the B-29's performance wasn't quite that good. Best case, it would have been coming over at maybe 30,000 and 300 miles per hour, but they never showed up in Germany anyhow. Now, as far as I know, that uh, scenario I just described, the TA-152 diving on the bomber and shooting it down and zoom climbing back up, as far as I know, that never actually happened. I just think that was the thought process of the design team. Of course, that design team was smart enough not to bet the entire pot on this idea, which is why other variants of the TA-152 have a lower aspect ratio wing, more optimized for low and medium altitudes. It's very apparent when you see a TA-152C model, for example, the wings are noticeably shorter. The TA-152H1 has another feature to help it fight at high altitudes, and it's a feature that was not commonplace, not unheard of, but not commonplace in 1944 and 1945, and that's the pressurized cockpit. Air is thin up high, and at 40,000 feet, it's really thin. In the Second World War, most planes were unpressurized, so pilots and other crew members wore oxygen masks at higher altitudes. This is the useful consciousness chart from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Notice the huge difference in time in useful consciousness between 25,000 feet and 40,000 feet. In the event that the pilot's oxygen mask or an oxygen system component would fail, it's likely that from 25,000 feet, the pilot would successfully perform an emergency descent because he would remain conscious long enough to do that. From 40,000 feet, survival is becoming pretty unlikely. In my opinion, this is the reason that the TA-152 and a few other World War II fighters that are intended for use at very high altitudes have pressurized cockpits. This way, you're not betting the life of the pilot and the airplane on a single 10 cent component in the oxygen system, and there's several of those. Here's a page from the TA-152H0 pilot manual. Now, I don't speak German, but I translated it, and we'll go over it now. If any of you German speakers want to add to this in the comments section, please do so, especially if you're a pilot or uh, generally knowledgeable on aircraft. I'll be the first to admit that translating aviation stuff from German is tricky. Now, I'm not trying to translate it here word for word, but get the actual picture of how to operate it. At 4,000 meters, which is about 13,100 feet, the pilot will put on and use the oxygen mask and keep using it when at or above that altitude. Okay, that makes sense. It's a little bit higher than the altitude typically used, but not a problem. The instructions say to open up the oxygen valve, and if I'm understanding this correctly, to monitor the system for proper operation. That's absolutely standard in every plane I've ever been in. Now this next section says, if you need additional oxygen to push with your elbow. That sounds strange, but here's what I think it means. Most aircraft, at least everyone I've flown with an oxygen system, are set up so that you don't normally breathe 100% oxygen from the bottle. The oxygen, oxygen is diluted with ambient air. This increases the supply duration. However, if needed, the pilot can select 100% oxygen with no dilution. This is highly effective. I've seen tired pilots put on the mask, hit that switch, and it wakes them right up. And I've flown with a lot of fighter pilots, and some have told me that they switch to 100% oxygen sometimes because it improves their night vision. I haven't personally verified that. But I'm assuming that the manual is describing an option to trigger 100% oxygen by pushing a switch of some type, which is activated with your elbow. Um, maybe Sheriff or Bismarck or another German-speaking aircraft expert can chime in on this one. But that's how it looks to me based on my experience. Now, 
At 8,000 meters, which is about 26,200 feet, it says to begin pressurizing the cockpit. This triggers a pump which forces air into the cockpit. The cockpit is sealed into a nearly airtight condition. The canopy is sealed by an inflatable tube. Think of it as circular weather stripping that inflates like an inner tube. In all pressurized aircraft I've flown, pressurization is regulated by a valve, normally called an outflow valve. This valve lets air out. Thus, the air coming in is coming in at a relatively constant rate, and the pressurization is controlled by controlling the air flowing out in almost all aircraft, and I think that's how it works in the TA-152. The manual says to open a valve. I'm guessing it's probably an outflow valve and to check the cockpit pressure occasionally and that it should be 8,000 meters, meaning that the air pressure in the cockpit is equal to air pressure at 8,000 meters. So they didn't pressurize the cockpit below 8,000 meters. That makes sense. Why put wear and tear on the system or run the risk of explosive decompression from battle damage like one bullet hole if you don't have to? As the aircraft climbs, they don't really pressurize it that much. A cockpit altitude of 8,000 meters, uh, or just over 26,000 feet, is really high by most standards. But I think the goal here was to only pressurize it enough so that if the oxygen system failed, the pilot would still be able to make that emergency descent. Again, I'm interjecting a lot of opinion here because of uh, lack of source documentation. But I think, I think my opinion is sound. I'm anxious to hear what you guys think. Anyhow, the TA-152's H1 pressurization system was capable of generating a pressure differential of 5.29 PSI. That's pretty darn good. That means it can make the air pressure in the cockpit 5.29 PSI higher than outside. As a comparative example, most modern jet airliners uh, go up to about 8, but they have circular fuselages, meaning the cross sections are round. Easier to pressurize a round thing. The TA-152's cockpit is a little bit of an odd shape. And among aircraft that aren't round, five, even modern ones, 5.29 is a pretty good number. Um, and what it means is it makes the air pressure in the cockpit 5.29 PSI higher than outside. Now, that's good enough to hold that 8,000 meter cabin altitude all the way up to the aircraft's incredible 15,100 meter which is 49,500 foot ceiling. Uh, note, as I mentioned earlier, some sources put the plane ceiling at 48,000. Either way, it has enough pressurization range to deal with it. Now, let's put the TA-152's performance chart back up and add in some allied aircraft for comparison. I'll start with the P-51D running 150 octane fuel, so a best case late model P-51. There is an H model P-51, never saw combat during the war. Now I'll use red dots for the P-51. At sea level it can reach 375 miles per hour or 604 kph, easily outrunning the TA-152 H1 down here. At 10,000 feet it can reach 416 miles per hour, 669 kph. At 20,000 feet the tables start to turn. The 51 can do 421 miles per hour or 678 kph. Up at 30,000 feet the Mustang is clearly behind and at 36,000 it's falling farther behind still. At 40,000 feet, which is 12,100 meters, I don't have a red dot for it because the Mustang falls off the left side of the chart with a maximum speed of 291 miles per hour or 458 kph. P-51D is a very good airplane, but it's not optimized for combat at 40,000 feet. Now, what about a late war Spitfire? I'm going to go with a Spitfire 21 with a late war Griffin engine, which, like the TA-152H1, runs a dual stage supercharger with three speeds. Now note, not all Griffins were set up with three speeds. I'm using a best case scenario here. I'll use pink dots for this one. As you can see, at 40,000 feet, even the fastest wartime Spitfire I could come up with, fast at this, at this altitude, um, is a lot slower than the 152H1. The pink ball at that altitude is about 80 kph behind the uh, Focal Wolf's line. I want to state that uh, as I put these dots on there, 
my level of precision with Microsoft Paint isn't that good. They're intended to all be at the same level, you know, and, and uh, they're, you know, they're all about right within a few miles per hour, but um, my artistic skills aren't that great. Moving on, the Hawker Tempest 5 was very fast, but again, not optimized for high altitude. I, I think, and I want to talk about this another time, it's, it's too big of a topic to get into right now, but had the Jet Age not arrived, I think that the Tempest sleeve valve engine would have proven to be the way forward. I think we, there would have been 3,000 horsepower Tempest by late 1945. In any case, although it's not really a high altitude fighter, it's one of the few aircraft to have actually fought the TA-152. Thus, I feel it belongs here, and I'll put it up here in blue. As you can see, the Tempest is very fast down low, but by 25,000, well, correction, by 28,000 feet, it's out of this race. The last fighter I'm going to add in is the P-47M. M is in Mike. Only 130 of these were built, but they did see combat in Europe. This is the fastest P-47 variant and the fastest Allied plane to see combat during the war, with the possible exception of the British Meteor jet fighter, kind of depending on how you define combat. So let's plot it. This time I'll use black. This particular Thunderbolt also had some reliability issues, which are talked about a lot. They were not caused by a flaw with the airplane. They were caused by saltwater damage during transport to Europe. In other words, how they were configured for transport allowed them to uh, get some damage. They got it all figured out, but it was replaced with the N model, N is in November anyway, although not in the European theater. The 47M, the one we're talking about here, is very fast at altitude and can outrun the TA-152 anywhere below 30,000 feet. However, the GM-1 system gives the TA-152 the edge once it's engaged. So it's pretty clear that at very high altitudes, the TA-152 was the fastest piston engine plane to see combat during the war. The P-47M is really the only plane that was a threat to it above 30,000 feet. I didn't plot the maximum speeds for each airplane because they all occur at different altitudes, but I'll mention that the 47M could do 473 miles per hour at 32,000 feet. So in terms of actual maximum, it's slightly faster than the TA-152. The big difference here is that per the flight manual, the 47M can't sustain this for more than a few minutes. The TA-152H1 can do it for 30 minutes. Even if the 47M pilot ignores the five-minute limitation, five limitation, and I have no doubt that he could do that without engine damage, but he's going to run out of water methanol way before the TA-152 does. I'm sure that somebody will bring up the Allied jets, the Meteor and the P-80 Shooting Star. I'm not putting up those comparisons for several reasons. First, the P-80 came on the scene too late to be a factor here. It did fly some reconnaissance missions out of Italy very late in the war, but that's about it. The Meteor flew a number of missions against V-1 buzz bombs, but was restricted from operating over enemy territory. That means its chances of encountering a TA-152 was about equal to that of the P-80, basically zero. Furthermore, the subject is complicated because these early jets were constantly improving. Deciding which, ver which version to use would lead to endless arguments. However, I will say that while both jets have higher top speeds than the TA-152, at least in very late war versions, uh, there is an altitude above which the TA-152 is faster than either, and the TA-152 has a higher ceiling than both. So, although the age of the piston engine fighter was really over by this point, the final fighter from Focke Wolf actually holds its own pretty well at the beginning of the jet age. There are a couple more things I want to mention from this chart. The performance curve next to the TA-152H1's line is for the TA-152C, C as in Charlie model. This model is using the DB603, which is why you don't see supercharger stages. It's one continuous curve due to the DB's variable supercharger drive mechanism. I have a video about that drive mechanism if you're curious. The C model also has shorter wings, as I mentioned, which 
is better for low and medium altitude performance. It does not have the pressurized cockpit. The C-Model prototypes have the supercharger intakes on the left side of the cowling due to the different configuration of the DB603 engine. I think the C-Model had a lot of potential but was never fully developed. I don't want to get too far into what-ifs, but when you're talking about these late war airplanes, it's kind of hard to avoid. Um, I think that the C-Model with an intercooler, good MW50, and GM1 would have been very tough to beat down low. However, it never had all of that, not properly set up, not even in the prototype stage. The H1 model was almost certainly the only variant to reach production. Nobody knows exactly how many were built, but it's certainly fewer than 100. Two survived, two, yeah, only two, survived the war intact and were captured by the Allies. One was cut up for scrap, um, it's actually this one here, and the other is somewhere at the Smithsonian. With the benefit of 2020 hindsight, we know that the H1 probably wasn't the right variant to build, at least I don't think so. There wasn't much need for it at the end of the war. Records on this are pretty spotty, but it appears that the few times it saw combat, it was at lower altitudes. TA-152s shot down between seven and maybe ten enemy aircraft total, with losses of four of their own. Certainly not enough to have any impact on the war, but considering how outnumbered they were, managing to shoot down anything at that point was very impressive. I want to thank my subscribers and especially my supporters on Patreon. Without Patreon support, these videos would be far fewer in number. In fact, a TA-152 video has been requested by Patreon supporters a number of times, which is the reason I made it now rather than later. At first I was thinking I might be getting the cart ahead of the horse here since I haven't put out my 190 series yet and the TA-152 is based on the Dora, which is based on the 190A, but I think that the TA-152 has enough unique features that it could be a standalone video anyway, hence here we are. Um, I'm going to put up uh, a few of the source documents for speed so you guys can peruse that if you want. Anyhow, that's all for now. Have a great day.